Hey everyone, Travis here from Travis.media. So I get this question regularly from developers and other IT professionals. What is Kubernetes? Like they haven't had to do anything with it and they just don't understand it. And they want a concise answer from me. And as you know, there's not really a concise answer for this. It's a loaded question. So I decided instead of fumbling through a bunch of words trying to give a concise answer, I'm just gonna create a video that I can point them to. And also, if you're new to it or are trying to learn Kubernetes in 2024, then you'll find this video beneficial as well. It's not gonna be just a bunch of diagrams. I'm actually gonna show you the tooling itself. So with all that said, Let's get started. So to understand Kubernetes, you must first understand containerization. A container is a standard unit of software that can package up your code in all of its dependencies so the application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. So you have an application, like here I have a default Next.js app and you'll create a blueprint for how your application needs to be run. And you'll use something like the Docker engine to build that blueprint into an image. So for example, this application, here's how I'm gonna build it. First, I'm gonna grab Node. I'm gonna create a directory called Frontend. I'm gonna copy my package.json in my package lock into that directory. I'm gonna run npm install. Then I'm gonna copy all of the code over to it. I'll expose port 3000 and I'll run npm run dev. This is my blueprint for running this app. It includes all of the code and all of the dependencies. To build this into an image, I'll run docker build and I'll tag it as sample app and I'll build my image. And docker has built my image. Using VS code, you can look here under images and you'll see I have a new image called sample app. So now anyone with this image that I've built can then run it, creating a container housing your running application. You can take the image, run it as a container. 10 other people can take the image and run it as a container as well. And every time it's run as a container, it includes everything needed to run that application and it spins up the same every time. No more, well, it works on my machine because it works everywhere. It has everything it needs to run on its own. The container is lightweight, it's standalone, and you can spin it up in a second, you can destroy it in a second. If it crashes, just spin up a new one. In fact, if you go to Docker Hub, there are thousands of images pre-made that you can pull down and use in your container. Like here's Alpine, Nginx, Ubuntu, Python, Redis, Postgres, and they're all public. And they'll run the same on everybody's machine. It's amazing technology and any app can be containerized. So the sample app, I can just run the Docker run command or here I can just right click and choose run. If you look up here, my sample apps are running. If I open this application on port 3000, I should now be able to see this app running in the browser. And with another click of the button, I can stop the container. And if I need it to run again, I just run it again. This is great, but what do we do with this now? We spin up a container, we run it on a Linux machine or in AWS. What if it crashes? What if we want to containerize our front end separately from our back end and have two containers? What if Tiger Woods is winning the masters on a Sunday and our container gets overloaded and we want to quickly spin up five more instances to evenly distribute behind a load balancer. And then when the game is over, kill three of those instances so that we can scale back. How do you orchestrate this process of deploying, managing, automating, and scaling scaling containerized applications. Well, you can use an open source solution called Kubernetes. But before we get to that, let's hear a quick word from today's sponsor, Cast AI. So Cast AI is the leading all-in-one platform for Kubernetes automation, optimization, security, and cost management. You simply deploy a lightweight read-only agent onto your Kubernetes cluster, and from there, you get three free features that work within 60 seconds. First, you get a savings report telling you how much you could save by optimizing instance sizes and types based on your usage. Two, you get a cost monitoring dashboard breaking things down over time by tags, labels, namespaces, etc. And third, you get a security report that scans your cluster for vulnerabilities and automatically prioritizes the fixes. And that's all free. If you move to a paid plan, then you get much more. You can set automation and it will, around the clock, monitor your cluster and rebalance pods to optimal configurations. And of course, like with any secure product, you remain in control with Cast AI's policies that allow you to specify rules and limits. And you continue to see your savings and changes made as your cluster gets upscaled and downscaled. It will even utilize spot instance automation with fallback that moves you back to on-demand while there's no capacity. And it's free to try out. Why not? But check this, if you use the link below, you'll get the paid optimization feature that I just mentioned for free 
for your first cluster. So check out the link below to take advantage of this deal today. Back to the video. All right, the second part is Kubernetes itself. So here's a diagram from the Kubernetes site. Every Kubernetes cluster has a control plane. That's what's in this rectangle here. I like to call it the master node. This node is its own Linux environment and can be either a physical or a virtual machine. It's the central point of your cluster and it contains all the system components that make Kubernetes work, like the API server that exposes the Kubernetes API to us, the etcd key value store for your cluster data, the scheduler, the controller manager, etc. And don't worry about what all of these mean, just know that they make global decisions about the cluster and you don't normally want your applications running on this master node. It's reserved for system components. Instead, you deploy your applications on worker nodes which are just additional Linux machines. If you look here at this red hat diagram, here's your control plane. Here's the API server, the scheduler, controller manager, etcd. That's your control plane. That's one Linux machine. Then you have these worker nodes, these additional machines that house your applications. And each worker node has a kubelet, which listens for instructions from the Kube API server. It serves to deploy and destroy containers, among other things. And each node has a Kube proxy, which allows services to talk to other containers on other nodes. And when you want to deploy an application, it runs as a pod on the node. And inside of that pod is your container, or multiple containers, if that's how you want to set it up. But usually there's one container in a pod. And depending on the size and capacity of your machine or node, you can have many, many applications running on it. And then when that one gets maxed, out, you can update the cluster to deploy a second worker node and a third worker node, however many you need. And finally, you can interact with the Kubernetes cluster by talking to the API server. And the easiest way to do this is to install the kubectl CLI. Let me show you how you can spin up a cluster for yourself right now on your computer and get hands on with it. So we're going to download Minikube today. If you just go to Google and type in Minikube, or if you go to minikube.sigs.kates.io, whatever, just go to Minikube, Google it, and you'll end up here. I'll just put a link below, maybe that's easier. But you'll want to install this, so choose your operating system, your architecture. I'm on a MacBook, so I would just do homebrew, like brew install Minikube, probably the easiest way. And you'll need to make sure that a container or a virtual machine manager is also running, like Docker. That's the easiest to get started with, in my opinion. So you'll also want to download the Docker desktop. Just go to docker.com, look for Docker desktop. Once that's downloaded, run it, and you'll be good. And then the final piece you'll need is the kubectl CLI. So just type that in, K-U-B-E-C-T-L. You'll get to this page and choose install kubectl on your system. And this isn't just for our demonstration. You'll actually be using kubectl on all the Kubernetes clusters you'll ever use. So just go ahead and do it. So with minikube installed, I can do a minikube start command. This is going to start a cluster on my machine. All right, so now that we've done all this theory, what does this Kubernetes cluster look like? So with Minikube, there's only one node, the master node. You have to do everything on that. So with kubectl, I can run kubectl get nodes. And you'll see I have one node called Minikube, and it's the control plane node. If you want to see what pods are running on the machine, you can do kubectl get pods. And Kubernetes has namespaces, so I'll do a dash A, capital A to get the pods from all namespaces. And you'll see all of my system pods. These are the pods or the system services that are running on this control plane. So you'll see here's etcd, here's the API server, controller manager, scheduler, things like that. So now, how do we deploy applications onto this cluster? Well, we can do that in a number of ways, but the most basic is called a Kubernetes deployment. It's a Kubernetes deployment object. Now with Kubernetes, we can declare in YAML the desired state of our resources, and Kubernetes will work to guarantee that state. So we give it the end product, and it'll do its magic to maintain that state at all times until we change it. So if I go to Google and type in Kubernetes deployments, you'll go to the deployments page. And what's neat about the Kubernetes documentation is that they always have some great examples. So here you can read about deployments and we get to the section called creating a deployment. The following is an example of a deployment. Here's the YAML and you're declaring the end state of your deployment and Kubernetes is gonna put it together for you. So this deployment object has an API version. All the objects have an API version. The kind is deployment and the metadata. So this deployment is gonna be named Nginx deployment because we're gonna be deploying some Nginx pods. The replicas states that we wanna deploy three pods of this application. But down here at the bottom, you get to this containers section. So within this pod, we have containers. And in this pod, we're gonna have a container called Nginx. 
The image, what it's gonna pull down from Docker Hub, is the Nginx container. Here we could take our own application, push it up to some image repository, maybe a private Docker Hub repository, and we could put our image in there and pull down our image. And then it's gonna use the port of container port 80. So let's copy this deployment object, and I'm gonna CD into my desktop. I'm gonna do a sudo vi nginx deployment.yaml. So I'll create a new file, and I'll paste these instructions in here, this YAML into this document, and I'll save it. And to apply this declaration or manifest, as it's called, to my Kubernetes cluster, I can run kubectl apply dash f for file name, and then I can use the nginx deployment.yaml. This is gonna apply this deployment to my cluster. And just to note, there are also imperative commands, like I can do a cube cuddle run and then put in the image that I wanna use and configure it that way. But for me, I like these things to be placed in version control so that everybody can be on the same page and nobody's making direct changes without it being checked in, just my preference. So when I wanna apply this, I just hit enter. Deployment created. Now if I do cube cuddle get pods, in all namespaces, you'll see that I have three new pods of Nginx deployment, and the status is container creating. They're not quite ready yet, so let's run this again, and we'll give it a second to create. And now if I run kubectl get pods all namespaces, I'll see three new pods for my Nginx deployment. And I can actually do a kubectl get deployments and see the actual deployment object. Namespace is default, and the deployment is named Nginx deployment. So there's one deployment, and in that deployment, there are three pods. Now what if I wanna bump it up to six pods? I can just open up my file. So sudo vi, open up that file again, and I can go down here to replicas and change this to six. And remember, this is declarative, so I'm just declaring my state. So I've changed this to six. As soon as I save this and run kubectl apply again, it should update that state to now have six pods. So let's run git pods, and you'll see I now have six pods running. And there's actually an imperative command that I can run to to change that replica set, but I like to keep it in a YAML file that I can check into some version control. So I can open it up again, switch this down to two, and it should kill off four of those pods. And I need to apply it, of course. So now when I do git pods, I should see I only have two pods. See how quick those are gone? So obviously there's much more you can do. So you could run the back end of your app in a container, in a pod, or three pods for high availability, and then run your front end in a separate container in a different pod or set of pods, and then expose it to a load balancer via a Kubernetes service and have a public IP and a DNS and all of that. You can set network policies and all sorts of configurations according to your own or your company's preferred architecture and application setup and all of that. And then as developers, we're updating the code, we're adding new features, and after we commit that, it kicks off some pipeline where a new image is built that can be deployed and ran on Kubernetes. But all of that's out of scope for this video. I can do more on specifics of how any of these things work. Just let me know down in the comments. But if you really want to visualize a Kubernetes cluster and what's going on inside of it, like all of the moving pieces, one tool I would really recommend, and no, this is not sponsored, it's just a tool that I've used a lot in the past, but it's called Lens. So if you go to Kate's, K -A -S, Lens dev. You can download the Lens desktop. This used to be all free. It looks like there's a pricing tier now. So I'm not sure what the free version gives you, but let me show you how this works. Let me open Lens. And Lens reads your cube config, so it knows all of your environments. So I can click here, browse your local catalog, and I'll see my mini cube environment here. So let's click on that. Let me make this bigger. So this gives you a graphical user interface for your Kubernetes cluster. So here I can look at my nodes. I have one node, a Minikube node. If I had worker nodes, they would show up. I can look at my pods for all namespaces. Here are my two Nginx pods that I deployed. Here you can see all of your pods. I can see all of my deployments in different things like stateful sets, replica sets, cron jobs. And then we have a config section, networking, uh, storage, namespaces, all kind of stuff. So if you wanna see all of the moving pieces in your Kubernetes cluster, 
with a graphical user interface, check out Lens. It's really the only one I've used in the past and the only one I could recommend. And finally, if you want to learn Kubernetes this year and you're looking for that number one resource, I've recommended this a ton in the past and I still recommend it. It's a Udemy course called Certified Kubernetes Administrator with Practice Tests. This course is so good. And the reason is this guy runs a website called CodeCloud. So when you sign up for this Udemy course, you actually get to use CodeCloud in their simulated Kubernetes environments to do your work on. So you learn a new concept, you go over there, they give you a terminal, and you practice hands-on all of these concepts. I really enjoyed the course, and I would recommend it. So that's it for today. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so, and I'll see you in the next video.